I'll screw this up. Yes, is it working? I'm pretty sure it's working. Okay, so <laughs> um, today, uh, and to close out our semester, we're gonna continue with this idea of realist utopias. Uh, raise your hand if you were able to look at those four uh, questions uh, for the activity. Anybody pull it up? Yeah? So you got kind of an idea of where we're going to be going today. So we're going to take this step by step, four steps. If we don't get to step four, that's okay. It's, you know, uh, as I said on Monday, you know, the thing is walking towards the tree, not necessarily picking the fruit sometimes. And that journey, very helpful. So, um, less so today will we need uh, the computers, more if you could bring out a uh, paper and pen. That'll definitely be more effective for today. And yeah, yeah, that should work. So let's do that first, and then we're gonna, like I said, take this step by step. And I'll go over, once again, this realist utopias idea. Yes. Uh, the one that you're gonna write on? Um, no, it'll be for your records. But more, <coughs> wait, what's up? I was <coughs> That's fine. Um, so, first and foremost, and to recap on realist utopias in here, I can pull it up real quick. essential, I think, for Marx, uh, what we're dealing with is men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected, they do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. So what that means, right, as we discussed on Monday, is we are all bounded, right, embedded within these social structures that are going to dictate what we can do. However, these social structures, if we have a problem with them, right, we're going to have a problem with them because of what we say is normative. So we have a descriptive aspect, what are these social structures? A normative aspect, what do we want these social structures to do? And then a prescriptive aspect, right? That is, what can we do within the bounds of those social structures to shift them more towards what we think they should do? Yeah. So today's activity is all about that discussing what our normative principles are and how we think we would be able to shift the social structure and social institutions to better match those norms. So the first step is what do y'all think, right, social institutions should do? And more concretely, what is work supposed to do? Um, work is supposed to generate income. Oh, wait, 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 we'll, we'll get there. Type it out first. We're gonna get everybody to write it down and take a moment. But uh, where you were already going, sounds good. <laughs> but type it out first, write it down. What is work supposed to do? And under what moral principles is work supposed to do that? If you need any clarification on, say, moral principles, um, just 
examinar. Yes, that's a good question. So can I explain moral principles? So thinking about moral principles would be to um, ask normative questions about, say, equality, justice, freedom. Um, so these broad terms that kind of encapsulate our values as a society. Um, and they can be even more specific. Like equality, it can be very abstract. But what would uh, equality mean concretely? So think about over the course of the semester, a major thing we've discussed is say inequality of wages based upon position within social structure. So that could be a way to think about the abstract moral principle of equality relative to work. Or justice. Or maybe you think that inequality is the moral principle that you would wish to, to use. I'll argue counter to that, <laughs> but you know, I don't want to impose upon you that set of moral principles. We can give it, say, a minute or two more. And Devin, I'm coming back to you first because I feel bad cutting you off. <laughs> Everybody looks about ready, which means there's that nice, okay, I'm just waiting here kind of pattern. Um, let's start with uh, Devin. What do you, uh, either question or both? Generate income to purchase goods and services uh, as part of a positive feedback loop to benefit the economy. And what was the last part about outsourcing? Out of debt. So bring in factors of outsourcing and increased profit margin. Did I get that all correct? Yeah. And under what moral principles? Uh, well, I said work is supposed to be a fair state to equal to all people, and it should be free to choose where you work so long as you take a place and do the job correctly so it's beneficial to the company. What was the last 
part about the company? repeat a lot of things just to make sure it gets covered by the microphone. So Devin's point was fair, safe, and equal for all. Free to choose where you work, connected to job being done correctly and beneficial to the company. Right? Who else would like to put forward their one and two? Uh, so I took a little bit of a different approach. I said that from a very basic standpoint, the reason that I would at least get up, wake up to go to work would be to provide food and shelter for the people I care about, whether that be myself or our family, and to have something that's mentally stimulating that past time. Um, thinking in the sense that if I was provided with food, shelter, and an activity to do every single day, I'm not so sure I would feel the need to work. And then under, do you want me to slow down? Or? No, you're going good. Um, and then under the moral principles, I had it that both parties should feel like they win if you're working for someone else. Um, and if you are working for yourself, then, um, or work, working for yourself or someone else, there's no reason that in a developed country like the US, you should go to work for 40 hours a week and not be able to provide yourself with the basic needs to sustain yourself, like food and shelter. I'm gonna simplify that to living wage, does that work for yeah. you? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so fair, safe, and equal for all Free to choose where you work so that you do the job. Cr oh, wait. <laughs> Sorry. Provide food, shelter for self and family. Seems like a decent idea. <laughs> Mentally stimulating to pass time if both of those provided. I, I wrote, then why work? Um, I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, uh, then also, both parties should feel like they win. No reason uh, if working 40 hours in a developed country like the United States, you aren't making a living wage. Um, Gabriel, and we're going to bring it all together after this. Let me get Gabriel last one. Uh, I said what Jadev what said, but kind of like opposite. I said that uh, work is supposed to, supposed to make the products and services so that it creates uh, order since there is a scarcity of resources. And then um, people are supposed to buy Services with their work, uh, uh, cash. Um, okay. And then since since it kind of like a, it's not just like a cycle which. Would you call that a market morality? Uh, sure. Or how would you wish to define that cycle? Uh, I don't know. Um, what do you mean, like, uh, how do I define it? So, like, um, so 
just to repeat, no, no. Work, we start with labor, labor makes products. Those products are used to fill, fulfill scarcity so that there's no longer scarcity going on. And then in order to access those products, people will take their cash, purchase those products, right? And so therefore you said that cycle equals out that the production and the consumption will equal out. So is it equaling out because of the buying and selling of goods? Or is it the work and then the valuation of work that's leading to the cycle of equaling out? I think uh, since people agree on the price usually, um, and physical work, market form of morality then. So kind of a, would you say it's kind of a microeconomics where it's supposed to, to be price signals that are uh, going off between buyers and sellers over time that then leads to an equilibrium? Yeah. Or, yeah? Yeah. That, okay. Cool. That works. So actually we can put that down here. What differences do y'all see in the statements that were made about why work and under what moral principles work occurs? How so? So would you say that work then is um, a priori or uh, a starting principle to the rest of what comes after? So work plus innovation, because we can get from the clay cup to a turvis, thermos. I rhymed, I like that, didn't even realize it before I said it. We could start a limerick. I don't know how that works, but it sounds fancy. Okay, I like that, okay. Um, who else would like to bring in? Do you think that there is a conflict between these moral positions or that they are complementary? I think our goal is to have them complementary, but overall they're conflicting because there are a lot of instances where the market is generating income, but it's at the expense of the workers. Okay.
this actually gets us into step two to what we're going to be doing. So let's say that we have two moral principles that we're working with that have come out of our discussion here. The first one is one that we can call like a market morality. There are sets of buyers and sellers, right? And they're going to produce a set of products at a certain price that will have a certain profit margin you know, that benefits the company. The other morality, which can be in conflict as I said, but could also be complementary and something we can hash out as we go forward, is this kind of psychology of provision, fulfillment, uh, the ability to provide for one's family in like a just manner, right? Uh, as Calvin had said, and kind of working together, where is it? Um, uh, the living wage aspect, that there's no reason someone working 40 hours should not be able to provide in a dignified manner for their family. So these are two moral principles, right? So what we wanna do now is using those moral principles, in a way we've already started to do this, right? That expensive workers, that this is the, uh, the contemporary work regime is this kind of market morality. How do we judge our current uh, structure of work and our institutions of work? Second, I'm going to write that down. That's very good. So would you say that our work is, our, our social institutions at this moment are normatively set up to fulfill the market morality then? So the way that work works, so you had stated, let me add in question three. Uh, one second, one second. Hold the thought, hold the thought. I'm gonna call it just wage for the other one. So, based on market morality and this idea of a just wage or psychological fulfillment, uh, how do we judge our current work arrangements? You stated that um, for now, uh, workers go and simplify, but go where the money is, not necessarily where skill, career, fulfillment takes them. Is that it, right, yeah? Okay, and then getting back then, so does that, that form of work, right, under current strictures, does that fit one of these normative arrangements? Or does that fail both normative arrangements? Mm -hmm. If it was the second one again, we talked about where you wake up to provide for yourself the people you care about. Does you only need to technically take care of yourself or provide for someone that you don't care or for someone that you don't need more at this point? Unless you just want something to do with you, you want extra money. But so let's go back to um a few weeks ago when we were discussing what happens to people's wages when they have to work outside of their skill set or their career path. So would this form of work lead to a more just wage if they're being forced out of their skill set career path? So would that match more with this idea of a company needs workers to do what they need in order to increase a profit margin? Okay. 
cut the pay and save money, you would shake in your head as well. What do you think? Well, it sounds Maybe. like, if I'm understanding it correctly, it sounds like you kind of have to because as you try to get, as you grow older and get into society, no matter what you originally wanted, you have to put that aside to focus on your needs. So you can't, if, if you wanted to pursue whatever field, if it's not going to give you the money that you need to survive, you're going to have to put that to the side and find a job that's going to help you survive in the world. Okay. Anybody else have a response to that? Which definitely I think builds from what Devin's saying. If it's about, I guess this sort of seems like it's more about the market, the economy, things like that. Um, but for me, I just think of it as when people retire, they retire because they are able to provide for themselves based on what they have. Not really, they don't retire because it's, say, better for the economy or um, better for someone else. It's more of that they do it for themselves, not for the business they work for. It's more of a selfish, um, I'm not saying it's selfish to retire, but it's more of, a, you're doing this for yourself, not as much for other entities. Mm -hmm. it's, and who gets to retire? People that are able to provide for themselves based on either luck or past work. And say, if we took a class analysis of who gets to retire, what social class would be more likely, or class is, more likely to be able to retire? Professional, managerial, not low level service sector jobs. So are there groups of people maybe that never get to retire? But it's a good point that they have people that do, they retire because they've built up a surplus, right? Do you think that that would be based upon them getting something closer to a just wage for their work. And then getting back to this discussion that there are these other people that are much more constrained by market morality. So do you think that certain groups in a class structure have to follow different normative sets of ideas? Like, what work conditions would y'all accept? I don't know, it would be acceptable within a class. And how so? Like, what would be acceptable to, to your class position, also position within the United States of America, et cetera? I would well, say uh, the minimum the wages as a structure of everything included. I guess that meaning uh, under $15 an hour being able to be provided benefits or substantial uh, arrangements so that you're able to live a life that's successful, I guess. Because a lot of times when you see, you know, we're talking about not necessarily going where your skill is, a lot of times people are doing that because they're, the skill level that they're in, the entry level position doesn't allow them to live a life that they find to be um, Yes, livable per se. Say you make come out of college, you're making eight dollars an hour. You have no benefits. You are living in an apartment that's six hundred dollars a month. It's going to be a lot harder to live on that. And if say there's a waitress job that comes up or a waiter or hostess or something that's twelve dollars an hour, you're probably going to take that because you see the money. And you don't see like the value of moving up in the chain because you most people are looking at the aspect of oh, I'm looking to make the million dollars and I'm looking to make the hundred thousand dollars when a lot of people these days are wanting it now because you see on TV and uh, perception of the now society where it's like when you look in most fields, you're going to make that money, but you have to move up if you're going to stay in your skill level. I think that's kind of what you look at with that. Okay. So a couple different things came out of that. But let's So let's go with I'm gonna start from the last thing you said first and then work my way back. So the, the C, um, there's a certain etiology of, um, of 
economic action, which we'll call uh, nowism. I like that. Yeah. Um, that definitely is impacting people's decision making within our society, right? That there's a level of what we can call instrumental reason that's just baked into the cake because of the culture in which we live. Right? You will attempt to make decisions to increase your income on average uh, quickly, uh, even if that hurts future earnings. But I think there's also coming out of what you said, a structure of nowism. You can, you can write a paper using this. I bet you get that published. <laughs> um, where, as you said, they make certain benefits and wages that are going to constrain their decisions because if somebody's making $8 an hour in their entry-level position and another position will pay them $12 and we both know, or all of us know, that $8 will not be sufficient to live on, it's not just that there's an ideology of nowism, which might be a way that comes to validate the structure of Taoism, that these people have to make these decisions right, if they want to cover bills. So getting back to the point of what Devin had said earlier, and I think also Gabriel had brought, uh, actually a lot of y'all brought in, um, that people will be pushed off their career paths or out of their skill set in order to be able to increase their wages, right? So. There's a structure and an ideology that's co-extensive of one another. They're interacting, and through that interaction, we get to what our normative framework for our society seems to be. At least, the way we've set it up is much more this idea of a market morality, right? There is not as much of a concern for what we could consider this other kind of moral principle that was coming out of what Calvin was discussing, of like a just wage, which is benefits, Wages, being able to retire at some moment in time because maybe it's insane that grandma's 75 and still busting her hump, right? So if we see the way that our society is going, we know that the what ought question, at least as it is now, is definitively this one, right? But what would it be if this was our what ought? Like, how would you set work up if this is what you wanted to occur? Here. For this one, take a, oh, wait. I'll let you, yeah, jump in. You already no, I was just going to say, so for a just wage, meaning where you can provide for yourself housing and food, is that what we were determining a just wage is? Yeah. Okay. That you get the part of the surplus that is due to you. It would be cheaper for companies to just set up their own apartment complex for all their employees and have this great life where sure you can make seven bucks an hour but um, you can still survive because you're already being provided with some basic necessities. Okay. Got one second, we'll come right to you. Let me write this down and then let me write that part down. I think some companies um. have even done that. I think Google maybe has some things set up kind of of that nature. Uh, I'm sorry. E.G. Google. Um, also SAS. They don't do housing, but they provide like daycare and things of that nature. There's a class question there. So. <laughs> um, yes, Devin. Um, I'll say technically the only way you could like, because there's different
Colin's a bad guy. <laughs> So, so does this then, does this have to equate to full equality for it to be a just system? It just has to equate to the way everybody can provide for themselves. It's that, so somebody who has a, a, a one story house, one bedroom, one bath can provide for themselves, that's a just wage. If somebody who has 10 stories in an elevator can provide for themselves, that's just wage for them. It just depends on how much money you can make. And would there be like a, a minimum level? And would there be a maximum level? Because I remember a couple weeks ago, Lewis brought up, and I think it's a very good idea to debate because we always look at the minimum, but is there a maximum level to this? Like there's a dude, I've always been amazed by it in India, who has a skyscraper as his house. Forget his name at the moment. Oh my. Yeah, and it is a skyscraper, correct? Like a 40, 50 story. It has so many bands. Um, how do you? A M P A N I. He is the richest man of India right now. What? The richest man of India. Skyscraper for a house. <laughs> and that's just one of his houses, right? So I get to that question of is there a maximum just as much as there a minimum to this idea of being able to provide for oneself? Well, that gets back to this question then, like what would we consider a part of a just wage? Would a minimum and a maximum be? And can social structures constrain or promote and impede certain actions by humans? Yes. Let me bring in Gabriel. Yes. I'm with you on that one. Uh, I just have a question. Like, mm -hmm. is it possible for like everyone to be that satisfied since like, because um, like, doesn't there have to be someone at at the bottom, since um, since if there wasn't, then um, then uh, people could like um, like things 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 would be worth less if like everyone could afford everything at the bottom. Um, so, is it possible to like have a have a just wage? Well, it gets to a question that I'll turn back to you. Who who gets put at the bottom? Um, I guess people who don't have uh, the right qualifications or those who, who don't work. But in this class, for instance, we went through a lot of data and theory that people are getting put at the bottom that has nothing to do with qualifications. I mean, like, I mean, like, I mean, not, not as bottom, like, I mean, like, the very bottom, as in, like, as in, like, poverty, like, in, like, mm -hmm. like, no house. So, um. Because if you, you know, if you look at the stats and you look at the relative numbers of deprivation, you know, the likelihood of being in poverty will, will intersect at those social structures we've discussed. Class, race, gender, and you will see that it's not due to their qualification. So the question becomes, and I'm with you on this, like if there's no bottom, what does that mean for the way we value things? But it also goes back to, well, who ends up at the bottom? And is it just that they're at the bottom? I would say probably not, but um, even if everything was just, like if all the problems were fixed, um, how would how would society work if um, everyone could live off of what they made without anyone at the bottom? Abby, and then we'll come to you. Um, I was gonna say kind of what you were just saying was like that we have to like take responsibility rather than like an individual. Like I think there needs to be like a some sort of like mutual understanding of like the stratification and like everything that we talked about in this class, like it's 
not just like, oh, you're not working hard, or like, oh, like we've seen that. So I think like, it would have to be like almost a change too of like, what we think people can provide, or like what they're, I mean, because it comes down to like, just like ideology, I think. So, I don't know, I think it would have to be like, like for earlier we were saying, what would I like accept, or what would we would accept, like we've been taught like a career, like we've gotten this far, and like that was only because I was born into the family that I was born into, it had nothing to do with me being smarter than, or like better, or anything than anyone else. But now, like for other people, like careers aren't really an option. Like just acknowledging that, like you can't just pay us all the same because, like, if you pay me the same as someone else the same, like our experiences have been different. Or like I might be able to, you know, like so some people can't afford childcare. You know, ten people in your house. Like there are things that you have to do. Like even if you paid them the same amount, if they're paying for more, like there are ways that like they pay more for car insurance. Like there's that that says that they pay more for certain neighborhood taxes. You know, it's all these things. So I think it would have to be like a larger uh, change. And I think you bring up a couple of things when it comes to you, Calvin. That's okay. I just wanted to, that gets back to also something Devin was saying about this providing for oneself is going to be based upon who that self is. And that self has different historical trajectories, different, uh, you know, uh, bills that are incurred because of the structure of their, their household that you know, because of the structure of their household and their history, there might be a, a need, right, if we want to rectify <laughs> uh, past injustices, that some may have to deal with less at a certain moment in time for, you know, to rectify that, but then what does that entail, and how does one convince a population of such changes, okay. which are right. <laughs> yeah, quite large, right, mm -hmm. and, and, and and why I'd be like, find new ways to do Mm-hmm. But, great points. All y'all, man, y'all are kicking ass. <laughs> anyway, uh, Calvin? I have for, I just got lost. It was just like a tweet that flew. Oh, sorry. Damn. No, 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 that's fine. <laughs> well, it'll come back. Watch, it'll come back. But, so what y'all are seeing, right, is as we start to look at our institutions as they are now constructed, lots of questions come up. It's not, and nor is it simple to say, you know, prescriptively, where are we going to go? I mean, you know, based upon two normative arrangements, we could state two very different things. You know, if we wanted to do market morality solely, we would prescribe certain things to occur. Like, say, for instance, doing away with the minimum wage entirely. That would definitively place people further into a, a competitive market system, right? Because then there would be no floor for them. But would that come in conflict with an idea of a just wage? So kind of like there's a question. Have y'all ever led Zeppelin? Right? There are two paths you can go by, um, but there's still time to change the one you're on kind of thing. Right? So in that, what they're stating right, is that these paths do not complement one another, they are definitively distinct paths. We're on one path, you can choose another one or we can go down this path. And then also I thought of another line while Gabriel was talking because there are people that do start at the bottom and go to the top. Um, it reminded me of uh, Jay-Z and his uh, song No Hook, it's great, but he says, you know, Rolls Royce to manure, uh, maneuver through the manure and the sewer that I grew up in. You know, I mean, it's a clear line of a guy that started definitively at the bottom and had the qualifications and the skill set to be able to rise to a point now he's worth, what, is several hundred million? <coughs> but is that a policy in, that we can implement? So, like, we, we want to have more social mode How so? Like, if, if social mobility was high, then, um, then, then, then everyone at the bottom would probably get to, 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 to the top, and like only 
only the top people could like move out a spot. So I think you get to a fundamental contradiction of the entire system. And it gets also to something that Abby was saying about the level of, uh, of injustice and inequality that exists and how large the change would need to be to address all of it. And then also to what Devin and Calvin have been saying, once again, everybody, Calvin. Um, but that, you know, would it entail then just full equality? And that has gone bust, especially when enforced by a centralized state, which actually doesn't enforce equality. The state just becomes the arbiter. That has been a horrendous system, I think, in the structure that it was carried out. So if you can't have social mobility because social mobility in and of itself increases competition and therefore can lead to further stratification over time because of more competition, can this system produce a just wage? Or do we just have to accept the system as it is? So maybe let's leave to the side the idea of the perfect, okay. uh, right? Because you know, I, don't, I can't see it at the top, but realistic, right? I think is a key word here because the perfect can be the enemy of the good. Right? So what would be a realistic way? Like you say, social mobility. Social mobility, if it increases, should mean that we're getting more of a just wage. So what would be a way to increase social mobility? How did we do it beforehand? So you would link then productivity to an idea of a just wage? Yes. So, yeah. Uh, I think this also follows along with how it used to be in the sense that it was more of a productivity-based society and more performance-based where if you can do something and do it well and you do that, you should be able to live a good life and that's kind of relating to what we talked about where we become more of a credential-based society where if you are great at, say, preparing tax documents and you can prepare a tax return for people, that doesn't matter. You're not going to be able to make a livable wage doing that unless you have that credential. It's not about what you can do. It's about whether or not you are in a social class that allows you to get a certification to do something. This is key, right, that there's we seem to have shifted to symbolic capital as a, a very strong way that people are able to move and symbolic capital has to be purchased with economic capital. It's not freely floating around and accessible to all. I, for, for both of y'all also, because y'all are bringing up this idea of productivity, what have wages and productivity done over the last 40 years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, y'all both. Same. Yeah. And wages haven't, because we showed that if wages are kept up with productivity, what was minimum wage was only like 18 bucks. Yes. Which is crazy. 
So once again, it gets back to this, you know, we have normative setups, right? What ought to be, if we're linking it to things like productivity, performance, skill, the system obviously is not rewarding those things, or at least it's not rewarding those things for large swaths of the population. So, you know, even leave to the side, you know, social mobility at the moment, just looking at wages in and of themselves and our what ought is that people should be paid based upon their level of productivity. And we recognize that their productivity is not being paid. So is our set of institutions at this moment, are they reaching the goal of what we think at a minimum should be the case that people that are productive should be paid for their production? But could the system survive? And I think this is a point you, you raised very well. Could the system survive in the long term if people were paid for their production? And it gets back to, I think, a point that Barbara and others start to make in very good ways. But could the system survive that way? Or the, could the profit margin continue to increase if one had to pay for the full cost of their labor? Some companies have such a large amount of money they don't know what to do with it. Why is that that necessary? Companies would have to shift to non profit a lot of the would probably in that case. Because they can get more tax benefits and stuff like that from doing that and then they just put the money back into their company whatever way possible. Well what about like a workers cooperative? As a way, which is kind of it's not a non profit, but a similar idea of that. The purpose of it is not, say, the increasing value of stock, right? Because part of what goes into the neoliberal work regime is that the stock price in and of itself represents more than the actual productivity of real goods and services. This is also why our shadow economy, as it's sometimes called, or the speculative economy, uh, is about three to five times the size of the economy of real goods and services. So there's more money by three to five times in a speculative economy than the economy of goods and services, that is, of production. And so for the nonprofit, it's the same thing, right? Nonprofits, do they have stock prices? But could you do away with stocks? That probably wouldn't be a good idea either. Because then how do you move capital from one spot to another or make decisions about what will get invested in and built, etc. I always like this one because I think it opens up a big bag of worms <laughs> that don't get resolved because this is, you know, sociology 205 and we're not going to get to solve all of these issues. But to open that bag and get to this question, I think is a really good one. If you can't pay people the real cost of their labor, how morally just can the system be at the end of the day? And then therefore, a realist, right? What are the limits? And how do we push those limits of what can be, say, a just wage? Or do we have to accept this market morality, which then means we have to accept people being at the bottom, regardless of whether or not they should be there? Is a parallel, and I think we're running, oh, we're out of time. I always do this, y'all, I'm sorry. Uh, well, one last parallel. It's kind of like, is it correct to have an innocent person in prison? Is that just? So, analogously, would it be just to have somebody at the bottom that should be at the top. Right. Stephen Jay Gould, and then y'all can go, once said that he was less concerned about measuring the IQ of people and more concerned about how many Einsteins had died in sweatshops. And I've always thought that that was a good way to think about work 
in contemporary society uh, in terms of these structures of inequality that can trap those who might be very skilled at the bottom. Anyway, next week, peer, peer group, peer review and group work. This was our last lecture. There is no more to read. Y'all did amazingly. And uh, I will see y'all on Monday. And you and I will talk now. Yes. So awesome. Let me do this. <laughs>